Okay, so we're going down uh, the list of the commandments, aren't we? I don't know how you're feeling about it uh, when our lives come under scrutiny of God's law. If in the first commandment we were called, it was all about the who, who we are to worship, that Yahweh demands exclusive covenant loyalty, uh, that we are to worship him alone. And in the second commandment, we see the how we are to worship, the underlying principle being that we're not to worship God in accordance to our own imaginations, but in how God has regulated that worship. In the third commandment, we see that how we are to revere his name, the who of worship again, and how we are to revere his name. The underlying principle, once again, is that we honour God with our words, that our yes is yes, that we keep our oaths, and even in the whole of life, our actions are ones which don't bring the honour God and don't bring his name, uh, in, don't dishonour his name. And now, in the fourth commandment, we see the when we are uh, to worship. Uh, the underlying principle uh, to our time and work and worship, how we are to rest on the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. For we work in six days and labour, and on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord. In the UK, we have a rich heritage, Christian heritage, don't we? In fact, our own laws in some small parts still in areas reflect the Decalogue in, in different ways. Whether that is from that we shouldn't murder and, and adultery and so on and so forth. And the Sabbath day commandment sadly has long been forsaken, hasn't it, by the masses in our nation. Only 4.7% of Christians attend a place of uh, public worship on the Sabbath now and that's not even the evangelical community that's everybody so you can imagine it's quite small 4.7 is small this nation has long been a godless nation with, but with the vestiges of a Christian heritage for it wasn't until 1994 in August 1994 that Sunday trading was legalized those of us who are older and around them can remember when Sunday was a day when all the shops were closed. Uh, I, I remember it as well. I wasn't a Christian at the time. I found it constraining, in fact, and a drudgery at that time. And so now the Sabbath is really a time which is desecrated where shop shopping has become the new public act of retail therapy, hasn't it? No longer is it a day of rest, but of retail therapy by the masses. And then, sadly, even in the evangelical community, the orthodox view of the Sabbath is being forgotten and replaced by... Uh, Christian thought that thinks that the Sabbath is no longer a distinct holy day to be set apart onto the worship of God. But it has become a day no different to others. Their Sabbath rest is now in Christ. That this law, specifically this law, is in somehow connected to the ceremonial and civil laws specified to Israel. So a lot of the other commandments, and yet they don't seem to walk away uh, from those. But this commandment is being ditched by many Christians. It even impacts those of us who are here today, probably. It's seen in the use of our time and the acts that we do on the Sabbath. We might give 45 minutes to God of our morning to God. But do we continue the rest of the day resting in God, pursuing God, finding pleasure in God, delighting in God, praying and spending time with our family? 
with God. I think at times we do not. I encourage you to return this evening to worship God publicly, corporately, for this is what God has ordained. That we worship God at every possible means. And morning and evening, we gather to worship God. We can do those acts of piety, necessity and mercy. But the fourth commandment is clear. We are to remember the Sabbath. That means that we're not to forget. Remember, forget. We can forget. Keep it holy. And we are to rest in the blessings of the day. Today I simply want to ask, I'm no great theologian who can expound all the depths of the Sabbath and the nuances of the Sabbath. There's loads in there. But we're simply going to be asking the question, why should we remember the Sabbath? Well, firstly, we should remember the Sabbath because it's written to remember the Sabbath. The Lord has spoken, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. These are God's ten standalone words. They are not optional. They have not been uh, superseded. They are still standing and are perpetual and universal for the whole world and for his people. This is God's perfect law. They continue and are abiding for generation and generation upon all peoples. They have not been abolished, superseded, only fulfilled by Christ. Remember the Sabbath here. Unlike this, the first three other commandments, we see this fourth commandment isn't in negative form. You shall not, you shall not. It's a commandment set in positive form to remember the Sabbath. The fact that it says remember means that the Sabbath principle must have been and practiced before the giving of the law at Sinai. Because they are being called to remember something which is already known and established. And I think in part it was known and established because we see it, the principle in Exodus chapter 16. Verses 22 to 30, when the Lord provides bread from heaven for them, manna from heaven, and the quail in the evening. And there in verse 22, it says, On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each, and when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord has commanded. It's already spoken. Rest, tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil and all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them and it did not stink and there was no worms in it. And Moses said, eat it today for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it. But on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. The Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in this place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested. On the seventh day. As the Lord instructed them. We see that this was the beginning of Israel's national life. A pattern of regular work and a holy day. To be set apart from the six. It was the seventh day for Israel, wasn't it? And which we see codified in the Decalogue here. Spoken by the very mouth of God and written with the finger of God. And this is Israel's pattern, isn't it? To the Orthodox Jew to this very day. 
But we can go back further, can't we? For it is written universally on the tablet of our hearts. On Adam's heart. A universal law of obedience was written upon his heart. But in particular not to eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it bound Adam and all his posterity to that personal, perfect, perpetual obedience. And Adam was endued with the power and the ability to keep it. And you imagine that. And the Lord gave this ordinance, this day of rest and work, this pattern, even before the fall. And yet God walked in the garden with Adam and yet there would be a day. Whether it ever became, I, I don't know what was the time span of from perfection and creation to the fall. Maybe you creationists can uh, tell me that one. But he failed, didn't he? He disobeyed. And sin came into the world and death came into the world. And dysfunctionality came into the world. But the same law which is written upon Adam was written upon all humanity. Even after the fall and it continued to be the perfect rule of righteousness even after the fall. And now this written word upon, what was written upon Adam's heart and all humanity is spoken. And to be codified in the Decalogue. In our Baptist Confession of chapter 19 verses in regard to the law of God. It says there in chapter 1, God gave to Adam a law of universal obedience. Written in his heart and a particular precept of not eating the fruit, a tree of knowledge of good and evil. By which he bound him and his posterity to personal, entire, exact and perpetual obedience. Promised life upon the fulfilling and threatened death upon the breach of it. Endowed him with power and the ability to keep it. This same law that was first written in the heart of man continued to be a perfect rule of righteousness after the fall. And was delivered by God on Mount Sinai in the Ten Commandments. And written in two tables. Four first containing our duty towards God and the other six our duty towards man. The Apostle Paul. Maybe you think, well, that's their confession, isn't it? I don't want to listen to that. Hope not. Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, 14 to 15, For when the Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. It's written on people's hearts. You know, you know when you do like the Ray Comfort bit? You know, oh, have you ever told a lie? <laughs> what about the Sabbath? Have you, do you keep the Sabbath? That, that condemns. That condemns the sinner. That condemns us because we don't. <laughs> it is high up there. as all. Just like Cain... Cain knew that murder was wrong, Genesis 4. He broke the sixth commandment. Joseph knew adultery was wrong, the seventh commandment. The Israelites had this prior sense of the Sabbath, even though the Lord commanded through Moses them, they had it, because it's written upon their hearts. And we too, intrinsically, before coming to Christ, we know that murder is wrong like Cain. We know adultery is wrong like Joseph. And we know that we need, as human beings, to flourish and function. After work, we need rest. <laughs> and God has given us a day for that rest. Now, don't get me wrong now. What are you thinking here? Oh, Aubrey, you, is this, are you just spousing some legalism here? This isn't drudgery, my friends. This is delight for the Christian. It should not be drudgery. Yes, if you've got that law written 
uh, upon your heart. The law is like a mirror. It will show your sin. It will condemn you. By the law we become conscious of sin. Says the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3. But we should remember. The Sabbath. It's written upon our hearts. So when we look at the law. We're not always going to see a pretty sight, like my school test papers. They were blank. I didn't turn up for them. It wasn't good. I failed. I don't even know what they did to my CSEs. The first four commandments. Have we always worshipped and served Yahweh exclusively? Have we not created and bowed down to idols of our own making before him? Have we not always not honoured him with our words and actions? Haven't we all broken the Sabbath in some shape or form? Yes, we have. And I'm not advocating legalism, for that is the drudgery. No, no. Romans chapter 3, if you turn with me in your Bibles, Romans chapter 3. Verse uh, 19. Paul has been revealing that uh, no one is righteous for all have sinned. And Jews as well, and Gentile. In verse 19, and now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world, this law, the whole world, everyone, may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So that rules out we cannot work our way up to God by being the law. So that, that, that rules out this drudgery of legalism, of continuing seeking uh, to, to, oh, I've got to do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Why? To obtain to God. You cannot do it. You become conscious of sin. goes on doesn't it no one will be justified in God's sight through the law in fact through the law we become conscious of sin therefore isn't the law that's the means of our acceptance to God or keeping the law we can read on for by verse 20 for by the works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So how are we justified? It goes on. But now, verse 21, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So the law and the prophets in the past are bearing witness to it. They are speaking of it. They are leading us to it. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Pointing us to Jesus and to the gospel that saves us. Christ is our righteousness. Through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So a lawbreaker like you and I can be accepted through faith in Jesus Christ. Confront, the law confronts us with our guilt and our sin and leads us to Christ in whom we find the forgiveness of sins, peace with God, his righteousness imputed to us, his law rewritten upon our hearts, his spirit put within And now, 
We delight in the law because he first loved us and we love him. We reciprocate. We are redeemed to be his true image bearers. To reflect his glory. To flourish as human beings. And his law is the means we place ourselves under in Christ. Delighting in the law. Knowing that Christ is our righteousness. That we might flourish as human beings. The law is good for us. Verse 31 of Romans 3 goes on. Faith doesn't nullify the law. It upholds the law. Faith delights in God's law. Therefore, just to recap, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, because it's universally written upon all our hearts, our consciences confirm it, but sin has distorted it, and we rebel against it. Two, because it was spoken the very oracles of God in God's perfect and perpetual binding law upon universally, upon all flesh. It leads us to Christ. For no flesh will be justified by the works of the law. Points us to Christ who fulfilled the law for us. So that faith doesn't nullify the law. It upholds the law. It delights in the law. To say, oh, we don't need this, 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 this law anymore. We, we don't need that law anymore. I'm in Christ. I don't need it. Man, the Sabbath is made for man. You need the Sabbath. God has provided it for us. Jesus has never come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And we can delight in it now as his true image bearers, saved by grace through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, we stumble and fall, but we are forgiven people. We are not accepted before God because of our works and our law keeping. We're accepted before God because faith through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's just, the, this is true freedom to delight in the law. Secondly, so remember, remember the Sabbath. We can remember this, because it's based upon creation, isn't it? It's based upon creation. This is where it's going back. Remember the creation principle and pattern he's saying. Verse 11, for in six days the Lord God made earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Creation 101, isn't it? Genesis 2, 2 to 3, on the seventh day, God finished his work he had done. He rested on the seventh day from all his work he had done. And so God blessed the seventh day, made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work he had done in creation. It's interesting to note here that the omnipotent Lord, the transcendent God, the uncaused cause of all things, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is from everlasting to everlasting God. He could have created the world in one nanosecond. He could have created the world in one billion years. But the scripture is clear, isn't it? That God chose to create the world and all that it was in six literal 24-hour days with both morning and evening. And then after six days of creativity, on the seventh day, the Lord blessed the seventh day and rested and made it holy. John Piper writes that the fact that the week exists is not to be taken for granted. Days exist because that is how long it takes the earth to rotate. Months exist because that is how long it takes the moon to wax and wane. Years exist because that's how long it takes the earth to revolve around the sun. But why does the week exist? It doesn't correspond to any phenomena in nature, he says. The answer is the week exists because God worked six days and rested on the seventh day. And this sets the pattern of our work and our rest in the Lord. God is showing us the principle and pattern of work and worship and rest. 
God has risen into humanity, a seven-day cycle. And it was established at creation. Being codified in the Ten Commandments. But it goes right back to the pattern of creation established by God. And that's why we should keep remember the Sabbath because God established that principle and pattern in creation. Not just placing it in his law. And we see that's how we live, isn't it? People, we seven, seven day weeks, it's how we live. Again, the Baptist Confession, chapter 22, on religious worship in the Sabbath day, paragraph 7 says, As it is the law of nature that in... Hang on. Yeah. As it is the law of nature that in general proportion of time by God's appointment be set apart for the worship of God, so by his word in a positive, moral and perpetual commandment, binding all men in all ages, you have a particularly appointed one day in seven for a Sabbath to be kept holy unto him, which from the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ was the last day of the week, and from the resurrection of Christ was changed to the first day of the week, which is called the Lord's Day. And is to be continued to the end of the world as the Christian Sabbath. The observation of the last day of the week being abolished. That's, that's unique to the confession there, that it being abolished there, which it is. And we'll get on to that later. So what can we learn from this creation principle and pattern? Well, Adam and Eve would have had this principle and pattern for six days of labour and seventh day of rest in perfection. And then also after the fall. It was needed then. How much more is it needed now after the fall? And uh, now we abide in Christ. Work became toilsome, didn't it, for, for Adam? A day of rest would have been needed. But the people have even desecrated that now. For sin has come into the world. So this sacred day has been rejected, hasn't it? This day of rest has been rejected by sinners who work and toil forevermore. As if it all depends upon them. What it's telling us, we are dependent upon God for in the whole of life. Others have ignored God's design for work and they're living off state handouts. Or being idle. People have abandoned God's pattern. And so we see a culture around and about us slouched out, burnt out, worn out, clapped out and broken down. Without God and without rest. Living for their own pursuits and pleasures. 24-7. For the temporal and not the spiritual. The principle, the pattern, of course, is that man, we are made to work. And we are made for worship. On that blessed day of rest. Oh yeah, the whole of life, of, of life is worship. Yes, it is. But we come on the Sabbath and worship God corporately in a way which is different that we cannot do throughout the week. I do not always worship God as I ought to do as I'm working through my life in the day to day. I am thinking of me. Me, 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 me. But on the Sabbath we come and we rest in God and we think of him. We exalt him. We worship him. We glory in him. And yes, we do in a whole life, but we don't always. And we encounter God. God promises to be with his people. Where two or three are gathered, that's where God is in the midst. He meets with his people. He comes. He tabernacles with us. It's an abiding necessity of weekly and physical and spiritual rest. It's essential for our human flourishing. And so, breaking this 
commandment, this very Sabbath day. Some people are breaking it. And it's as serious as breaking the other nine. It is to lead them. To lead them, to point them. To become conscious of sin. And you can use this commandment as much as you can use the other nine with sinners. And how are you doing on your Sabbath? Is it drudgery? It's listening to me maybe drudgery to you. I hope not. Is it drudgery or a delight? It ought to be a delight because of our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has fulfilled the law. And has brought us freedom in Christ. God is the source of all blessings. The Sabbath reminds us that he is the true source. Of our provision and our blessings. Of our industrious. Our own industriousness is not the ultimate means of our survival. Rather the Sabbath is our weekly reminder that man does not live by bread alone. God has built us into this, as humans, into this creation uh, rhythm of this seven-day cycle. Designed that we might look from outside of ourselves to the transcendent one. And that we might be dependent upon him. And trust in him. It takes faith to stop working in order to spend time with God. This is faithful rest, ceasing from all work. It's both a blessing and a means of blessing to God. It will bless our bodies, our minds, be renewed, and our souls. Work is good, but it's not the ultimate. God is the ultimate. Yes, our labour honours God, it images God who laboured in creation. However, rest also honours God. It images God and points to our rest in God. Who rested himself on the seventh day. And so we need that right biblical balance between work and rest. If one dominates the other, we will create idols. And so the Sabbath points us outside of our weekly routine to two greater realities. The ultimate is to find rest to come. And to Christ who has won that rest. And we will be partakers of that new creation. And that blessed rest to, in glory to come. Without this weekly reorientation towards the ultimate things, we tend to elevate the temporal. And so even the temporal can take us away from the spiritual of the Sabbath. And we can be consumed with the temporal things when we go from this place. And not be consumed in fellowship with God and delight in God and speak of God and walk with God. In our families and with one another. So the Sabbath is an opportunity for us to come and to seek first the kingdom of God. To store up treasures in heaven. And not fret about matters pertaining to this world and life. And pursue and find pleasure in God. So remember the Sabbath because of the creation principle and pattern. But remember the Sabbath, and this is my just last point and short brief. It's related to redemption. Or it's re related to redemption. And then I thought today, before I was coming, in Colossians there, it talks about, doesn't it? Colossians chapter 2, I read that. Let's just turn. Excuse me. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 13. And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. 
This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink and with regard to festival or new moon or a Sabbath. Okay, and that's a verse that they take. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. He's talking about subsequent uh, Sabbaths. Talking about this uh, God's mosaic, his moral law here, this Sabbath day. The early church met, didn't they, on that resurrection day, the Lord's day, the first day of the week. And they worshipped God. And they broke bread. And they heard the apostles' doctrine. And they fellowshiped and they... And they witnessed and did works of mercy and necessity and piety. But the Sabbath has not been abolished. Why should that one just be pulled out? Because it's got uh, mosaic uh, civil uh, ceremonial laws connected to it. So as the, 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 the wayward son and the person who lies, should we just... Uh, throw those out the person who commits adultery be stoned to death we don't stone people to death now oh we remember the sabbath because of Christ's redemption the greater redemption as we read in Deuteronomy if Exodus talks about this commandment and it's framed around God's creative work in creation and God is calling us to model that principle, that pattern of six days and a day of rest to worship and serve God. Then in Deuteronomy we see that it's framed around God's redemption of Israel out of slavery. That's what he says. For you were slaves, you were in bondage in Egypt and redemption comes. And the moral law is given. They were redeemed and the covenant, Mosaic covenant given that they might delight in it. Of course they couldn't unless they were living by faith. And looking to the promises and looking to the promise of the Messiah. They received the land. They, had, they had received kings. They were redeemed. But they were disobedient and they never inherited the promises. The greater promises. But we, we were those in bondage and slavery. And we were redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, by God himself, by his mighty outstretched arm. He delivered us. Why? That we might love him and delight in him. And how is that possible? Not through the law, not through the Mosaic covenant, but through the new covenant. Saved by grace through faith. And that God might put his spirit within and write his, rewrite his law upon our hearts. That we might walk in his ways and delight in his precepts. He has redeemed us for that. And on the Sabbath we can come together and collectively enjoy him and worship him. The early church practiced it, didn't they? 1 Corinthians 16, 1, 2, the first day of the week, they would come together and put something aside. On the first day of the week, they broke bread together. Acts 27, Revelation 1, 10, John, on the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit. Coming together upon the Christian Sabbath. On the first day of the week. So that we can worship the resurrected, ascended and exalted Lord Hence, we've transitioned now, haven't we? As a result of Christ's greater redemption, we've transitioned from the seventh day to the first day of the week. So what does that mean? Well, we see that we're still keeping the moral principle of one day in seven. It's not about the day, it's the principle. One day in seven, set aside. Well, it is about the day in that it's the resurrection day. It's a new creation act. The first day of the week. 
And Jesus himself said, I have all authority. The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath, Matthew 12, 8. And so this day continues to be the Christian Sabbath until the end of the world. Until the consummation and we enter into our future reality of our blessed rest in all its fullness. We're not there yet. And this is our distinctly Christian, not Jewish, Sabbath. That last day of the week being abolished by Christ's resurrection and new creation. What can I ask? Can I ask, what is the Christian Sabbath to you? Is it drudgery or delight? At the Lord's table, we remember him. We reap all the blessed benefits through faith as we partake and feast upon Christ. We worship him and sing hymns of praise, being taken to glorious heights above and depths above. We commune in prayer with him as priest and mediator. And in his name we pray, we baptise those who believe, and identify, who believe and identify with him in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. We teach and preach Christ crucified. We speak of him throughout all the scriptures. We see Christ. And we go into our working week rested and blessed in Christ. And go out of this place to live to the praise of his glorious grace. So in closing, will you remember and delight in the Sabbath? Only if God has rewritten his law upon your heart. Not as a covenant of works in Adam or in a mosaic form which brings death. But as promised in a new covenant in Christ. And in him we can delight and live as God's true image bearers flourishing under God's law. Delighting in it blesses the man who delights in the word of the Lord. Will you remember and delight in the Sabbath? If God is your creator, you will. Whom you're dependent upon. For everything who has ordained six days of work and a blessed day of rest. May all our days and moments be consecrated to God. May we live out holy lives. May this be a blessed, sacred day to us more and more. Will you remember and delight in the Sabbath? Well, only if your Redeemer is Christ through the blood of the cross. For we are not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ. We have that new freedom and love and desire to uphold the law. As God truly intended. So that we can flourish and live to God's glory being his image bearers. And finally we remember the Sabbath and delight in it. Because it points us forward to that final blessed day of rest. At the consummation. And so we must persevere. We must not give up in meeting together. We must remember the Sabbath. We must set it apart more and more in our diaries and put everything else out and say, I am going to centre upon God today. As for me and my house today, we're going to worship and serve the Lord today. Depending upon God for that blessed Sabbath rest to come. And you can read about that in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 to 11. But there I'm going to close. Amen.